This Week in Parasitism is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twip. This week in Parasitism, episode number 33, recorded on November 22nd, 2011. Hi everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and with me is Dixon Despommier. Hello, Vincent. Uh, is November 22nd when JFK was assassinated, or was Ooh. that the 23rd? I, you know, we've got our little computer right here. Why don't we look that one up? <clears throat> Why? This is parasitism. I know. <laughs> Not predator prey relationships. Twenty second November. Really? Yes, it's uh, forty eight years ago. Why haven't we heard anything on the news about this? I don't listen to the news. How anymore. did you think of this then? <laughs> because November twenty second, when I was Vince, so traumatized by that, I was here at this. You were? Yeah, I was. I was a technician. It was nineteen sixty three. I was in yeah. you know, grammar school. I was actually not a technician at that point. I was a graduate student. Are you that much older than I am? I'm afraid I am, Vince. I'm 71. How old are you? 58. Then that means That's I'm older. That's the difference, than you. isn't it? <laughs> right, but the physicists tell us that the time is an illusion rather than a reality, so I, I don't worry about it. I think the world would have been a very different place had he not been assassinated, but that's just my opinion. Um, I agree with you. Anyway, so today is the 48th. Uh, anniversary, I hate to use yeah. that word, of yeah. the assassination yeah. of John F. Kennedy. Hmm. And that's that. But today is also episode 33 of TWIP. That it is. And Dixon and I, as you see, are making an effort to <laughs> go beyond more often. <laughs> that's right. That's right. We're trying to add more frequency to the this week. Did you know that there are some free living protozoans called click and clack? I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they don't exist. Uh, we decided we'd do a paper in a lot of uh, email today. Right. How does that sound? It sounds good. To I have me. a whole bunch of emails backed I, up. I can imagine. I we can should do only them. imagine. But first, do you want to talk about a paper? Sure. It's a paper that you selected. It is. How do you select papers, Dixon? I'm just curious. Yeah, well, what do you do? This is a relatively new addition to our show because we've moved on from the basic information now to the tapestry of each of these organisms. The tapestry. No, 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 I think this is true. You know, Are you, you saying that they're rugs? <clears throat> no, 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 no. They're, uh, what are they? They're, they're complex organisms living inside of another complex organism. Mm, so that sounds like a parasite. It is a, definitely a parasite. That's right. And so... We've covered the basics of how these parasites go from one host to another and how they might live out part of their lives in the host. But, but these parasites have all attracted the attention of biological researchers. And since they've been discovered, they've been worked on by people in the laboratory and in the field to answer various kinds of questions depending on what's missing in terms of information. And so to begin to review the literature covering some of these issues that uh, still plague, no pun intended, mm. the general population with regards to parasitism, and in this case eukaryotic parasites, I think is a good thing. So I know that you have another podcast called This Week in Virology in which you do review papers routinely. Yes, almost every week. Almost yeah. every week. And I think we should make that our mantra uh, someone has written us a letter, by the way, which we'll get to later, that says we haven't covered all the parasite life cycles yet. Uh, That's we've, true, right? Yeah, it is always true because you know there are lots of parasites that infect the human host, but we've only we've discussed all of the major ones. Okay, but people would like to have some <coughs> minor ones as you well. Know, Right here. Okay, so we're going to challenge our listeners. So in fact, remember the amoeba that go in your nose. The Neglaria. We should do, let's talk about those sometime. I thought we did when we discussed intermediate histolytica. No, in fact, Chuck Knirsch said he'd come back and talk about it. He well, okay. A, he had a case uh, presentation that he did. and he Excellent. Let's get him back on here then. He's a good friend of mine. I don't know. Yeah, he, he, he enjoyed said, being it. And I, I was listening to his episode, and at right. the end he said he would come back and talk about that case. Excellent. A case presentation would be interesting, right? It would. 
Because that's the uh, takeoff point for the biology of the, of the parasite, yeah. right? So we could introduce with a little biology and then case presentation. There you go. 45-year-old male See presented that? blah, blah. So know, what is that, that called? Those are called Grand CPCs. Grand rounds? CPC? Clinical uh, Pathology uh, Consultation. Okay. CPC. I've been involved in many of them at this hospital. They're quite interesting because they do lead you back to the general information. So maybe our listeners could uh, send in through the email uh, forum no, the parasites they should, that they would like to hear about that they haven't heard about. Okay. Well, we have a few already, but if you have some favorite... No, we'd love to know. We would, will do it. I'll sure. convince Dixon. But I would like a letter with a stamp on it. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> Snail mail. I do occasionally mail letters. <laughs> yeah, you know, I've heard of that technique. You know, one of the things... With the price of mail going up and up, though, can you imagine? When I, when I need to get reimbursed for travel, they want the original receipts. I know that. Isn't that's that absurd? Kill, and that's killing me, too. I, I mean, mean, that's I could crazy. scan them and email them. That would be so you much You know what easier. I do? I, I get my monthly statement in, in for an email, right, from my bank. Sure. And I localize the payment section of each of those bills, and then I just uh, do a screenshot. Yeah. And I send them that, and that's good enough. That's fine. That's good enough. You know, you can get a check and deposit it with your iPhone now. You can do that. That worries me a little bit, though, don't you think? It's a little bit too removed from the reality of money now. <laughs> People like to... And you can... I'll bet you that it's going to come up with a card that you just stick into a slot someplace in a store, and it automatically subtracts it from your bank account. And you know, Well, you, that's called a debit card. It's called a debit card. <laughs> but you're worried about the parasites, aren't you? <laughs> I'm worried about not seeing where my money really is. You know, you, you like to hold it every now nah, and then. I don't then care. Just know you've don't, got some? I would rather get rid of the wallet. <laughs> I have an implanted chip. You, you put your groceries yeah, in, a, yeah. in a cart. You walk through the scanner, and there's no one there. It ah. scans the whole basket and deducts it from the chip implanted under your skin. Do you, under, why does it have to be under your skin, Vince? So nobody can Sounds take like it. like a parasite. Unless they cut you open. open. <laughs> yeah, it is parasitic. Eek. Well, and then people can steal from it. Anyway, we digress, don't we, we Dixon? We do. That's okay, though, because I think we're sharing a lot of common information here that other people feel sensitive about. Well, as well. also, this is a microcosm of our usual day. Yeah. Because when you walk in the door, we always digress. We do. It's, it's part sad. of life. We in fact, life focus, is a digression. <laughs> From what? <laughs> from, from from the alternative entropy. <laughs> ah, I see. All right, the paper. Anyway, you never answered my question. What was the question? How do you pick papers? Oh, how do I or pick papers? Or how do you not just pick, but when you are scanning the literature, what do you look for? Sure. Well, you know, I regularly subscribe to uh, several professional journals. and uh, I, I subscribe to non-professional journals. <laughs> what do, what, well, you mean professional, meaning... Uh, well, the American Society for Parasitology. Okay. And the American Society for Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. And Chemical and Engineering News. And Science. Why, why do you have to subscribe to anything? Everything is online. I know, but, you know, I, I just like to maintain my presence in those things and they deserve my support right, so you look there you see what catches your yeah, eye no, I, what about the rest of the literature so, well sometimes i go to pubmed and i type out a topic i go to pubmed just about every hour yeah pubmed is a great source but i understand from our new faculty member here sagi uh -huh. that it's not very good that google scholar is much better really yeah, but I my workflow does not involve Google Scholar. It's PubMed. Yeah, PubMed, PubMed is for me. But too. I've often found that when you search PubMed, you don't get things. And then if you go to Google Scholar, you will get them. Oh, I see. I don't understand that. But I, I right. like the way the search results are presented in PubMed as opposed to Google Scholar. Yeah, I mean, they're published in order of publication. Well, right you can years. select any any sort. Uh, but the most recent order. is first, is what you I'm You can saying. select any order you want. Did oh, you know I, that? I prefer the most recent first. <laughs> oh, you're saying what you prefer, but... <laughs> you're asking me how I select papers. <laughs> so okay, you know, Let's say I'm interested in a topic. Let's go to PubMed right here. Let's, let's go to the do videotape. Des Palmier. No, let's not do that. Dixon, we'll put in. Des Palmier D. I haven't the published. Rise of Vertical Farms. Look at the Scientific American. But Get you can go here. Is here. that there? Oh, yeah, it's right here in PubMed. There's oh, now Index. It probably always has been. You go to display settings and you can click on it and you can sort by recently added publication date, first author, last author, journal, or title. Well, that's interesting. So let's look at publication date and sort yours. And right. that, of course, is the most recent. Yeah. And before that, chemical trails and the parasites that follow them. Oh, my. That's a PNAS paper. It is. Is that a review? It was a review. I reviewed the paper. No, no. You wrote it. No, I didn't write that one. <laughs> it says you're the author. Well... 
that was actually written by some other people. I see. I reviewed, oh, it's a comment. It's I a see. comment on Got a paper it. published by Jerry Shadow. Isn't it funny that they index comments? It, well, then the, no, the next one before that is 2003. Toxocariasis. Yeah. Toxicariasis. Toxicariasis. Yeah. I'm just not a member of this club. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are, Vince. And then the one before that is 98. Does How does Trichinella spiralis make itself at home? Exactly. So the point here They're is... They're missing Dixon. a lot of articles, actually. They are? Yeah. Well, let's do the same search in Google Scholar. Okay. And see if we pick them up. Now, remember, listeners, I've been retired for a few years now, so <laughs> my publication rate has uh, decreased. Yeah, we don't hold that against you. I'm... I'm just telling you. Are you being insecure? Partially. <laughs> we're all insecure, Vince. All right, we go to scholar.google.com. Okay. And we're going to take out patents. I don't care about your nah, patents. I, I, Do you have I, any patents? No, but I tried once, but it didn't work out. <laughs> How about patent leather? I was going to go to that next, but forget about it. Um, now we have additional. I knew. Look at this. Of course. So how do we sort them? By date. I mean, just do it by year. You know, there's not an obvious way to sort articles excluding patents any times, and you could also restrict the year. That's very interesting. Right. Include citations. Right. But I don't know uh, how to sort it. So there are more citations on Google Scholar than there are. Well, there should be. Look at this. There are many more. Well, I... I... Infectivity of the newborn larva of Trichinella spiralis in the rat. You got it. And you see the PDFs for some of these are available. Yep. So, uh, unfortunately, I don't like this presentation as much as I like the... Uh, the PubMed, yeah. PubMed. I know what you mean. And you can't resort these by other criteria unless... No. Unless I go to... So advanced. that's not going to be the pick of the week for you. Is that, is that no, what you're saying? No, that's not going to be my pick. All right, so we, we <coughs> that's how you you look for papers. You kind of scan PubMed. Do you right. have a search term that you put in every week or every day? I don't. Do you know what I do? I don't know. Do you care? Sure. All right, you can go to PubMed. I care, I care. You can go to PubMed yes. and search for something. Right. So I search for poliovirus. All, all right. right. But I don't want to do that every day. No, of course not. So you can save any search and have the results emailed to and you. And they keep And they keep doing it. them to you. As often as you want. It could be every hour, every day, every week, every month. That sounds great. So every day yep. I have a certain number of searches yep. done yep. and run. And, and sent to me by email. So I, I do regular searches for Trichinella, by the way, because that's what I used to work on. And uh, I'm still curious about the literature and how it's evolving. And so I do, I, I go to PubMed maybe once a week or once every two weeks to find out what's new. So maybe I should just type out Trichinella nurse cell development and just leave it at that. Yeah, because there are a lot of other things. There are, if you type Trichinella in PubMed, oh, you, you get, get a bunch of stuff. 3, 000, excuse me, 3,788 right. papers. Right. Now, if you type Trichinella nurse cell, cell, anything else? Development. Development. Now you narrow that down to 25 papers. 25 papers. The most recent being 2006, which is can't be, right? No. Let's no. take out development. Right. How about that? I just take a nurse. I hope everyone is not bored. <laughs> now we go up to 71. The latest is 2011. Bingo. And who, who published that paper by any chance? Kang, Joe, Cho, okay. Yu, and Ak, and Cha. Okay. okay. You got that? Yep. Trichinella spiralis infection induces angiogenic factor thymus and beta-4 expression. And that's Dixon's baby, the angiogenic factor. <laughs> that's right. Thank God somebody picked it this up. This is from South Korea. That's nice. Where they're building a vertical farm, by <clears> the they've way. They've already built one. All right, now we've digressed for a long time. I wanted Dixon to tell you how he finds his papers. And so this is one of his results in a journal called PLOS One. Aha. Uh-huh. And the paper is called Genome-Wide Identification of Molecular Mimicry Candidates in Parasites. Why did this catch your eye? Well, Vince, it's interesting you should ask me that. Because, um, you know, when you get to be a certain... Age. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't say that, but that's probably true. And if you're still surviving in the academic community, you turn your attention to the broader issues that you were unable to address as a functional member of the scientific community, uh, meaning that you're now involved in writing review articles, review, reviewing articles for publication, and perhaps writing a book or two. So right now I'm writing a book on uh, parasites. Ah, that explains it. So the, the title of this book is called People, Parasites, and Plowshares. 
And the uh, premise of the book is that parasites have a lot of secrets locked up in their biology that if we were to discover them, we could apply them to medical problems that face us every day, which have nothing to do with the interpersonal relationships between parasites and hosts. Uh, for instance, if we could determine how schistosomes mask themselves from our immune system, we might be able to apply that to something like organ transplants, that sort of thing. So uh, I was looking up how parasites hide from the immune system. So it, I found you, this article. Are you going to have a chapter on this in the book? <clears throat> of course. So let's define molecular... I call them Houdini's cousins. nefarious cousins. Very good. You're so creative with the titles. Um, Vince, please don't uh, don't patronize me. <laughs> what are the other titles? Any other? <clears throat> I've got some. I've got some. When other is titles. this going to be published? I bet some of our listeners might want to buy it. Um, I couldn't imagine that, but uh, I'm not saying that for that reason at all. It's it, Columbia University Press has uh, has uh, actually uh, commissioned me to do this book, and uh, it should be out uh, in another year from now. The publication process is so it's molasses like. Incredibly slow, unless it's an ebook. Yeah, ebooks can go up the day after you finish them. Oh, you're not finished writing, though, right? No, I'm not. So, part of the research involves biomimicry and how parasites escape. The real theme of this book is why do some parasites live in us for long periods of time, like years at a time? What allows them to do that? Because other parasites come and go. They do their damage, we fight them off, or we die, and that's the end. Maybe three mm. or four weeks of time and you're finished with them. But other parasites can last for 20 to 30 years. And the filarial parasites, which this article addresses, uh, can live inside of our lymphatic vessels. In lymph vessels, Vince, this is like looking down the barrel of a loaded gun. What the heck is this parasite doing living in the face of a very strong immune response system? such as the one developed in humans. Mm. So it lives there for 10 to 15 years in some cases. Right. And there are two major species that live in humans, which are Aria bancrofti, which we've covered right. in our basic uh, parasitic disease lectures, and Brugia malayi. Mm, we didn't cover Brugia, did we? We did not, but it's basically the it's same like, life It's cycle. like Wucaria? It's like Wucheraria. Wucheraria, which I never pronounced. Uh, uh, Wucher, the, the guy's name is Wucher, but they don't pronounce it Wucheraria. They pronounce it Wucheraria. Wucheraria, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so Bancroft and Wucher were two people that worked on this. I know, there are pictures outside your... They are. Area. I've got my heroes uh, hung up on my are wall. Are they your heroes? They are. They are. Maybe we should post them on the web. That's my pick of the week, Vince. <laughs> pictures of Wucher and Bancroft? I'm going I'm to take pictures of all of those. I'll okay. make screenshots of them. I'll scan them and make screenshots, and then we can po post uh, them for everybody else to well, see. That, that'll happen. By the way, the, the, the listeners should know that I dug these pictures out of the garbage. You look through the garbage regularly? Somebody, somebody was throwing them away, and I just... If you, you went rescued. into a dumpster or something on the street? Well, it wasn't a dumpster. It was part of a laboratory teardown to I make see. room for another laboratory. Okay. So I actually inherited these pictures. So I, I, I treasure them. One of them is of uh, Walter Reed, of all people. Another one is Wuchger. It's one of you. And no, there's none of me. He was in the <laughs> there should never be any of me. <laughs> that would be a big mistake. They were throwing a So at any rate, this paper emerged out of a literature search online that said, um, um, I forget the search terms that I used, but I think that um, immune evasion was part of it. A parasite immune evasion mechanisms. Parasite yes. immune evasion. Basically. In fact, that's so this this article, which is did I give the title yet? <clears throat> Not yet. It's called "Genome Wide Identification of Molecular Mimicry Candidates and Parasites" by Luden, Nielsen, and Mazer from Switzerland. Mazer or Mazel? Mazer, M A S E R. Mazer, okay, fine. Because Rick Mazel does work on this too. And they go through the beginning. They talk about how parasites evade right. the host in various ways, and right. one of the least understood mechanisms is yes. what's called molecular mimicry as a Indeed. strategy for immune evasion and right. host manipulation. So they give credit to the establisher of that term, which is Raymond Damien. Raymond? Raymond Damien. Ray Damien. 1964. He, that's right. He, were, he was the chairman of our study section at NIH during the, the years that I served on the study section. 47 years ago, and Lyndon Johnson was president of that's the right. U.S. That's right. That's right. He defined molecular mimicry. He coined it. Mimicry. What did I say? <laughs> mimicry. <laughs> oh boy, do I do that often? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we 
you hear me recently? Sometimes and sometimes not. <laughs> he defined molecular mimicry, which he coined yes. as the sharing of antigens between parasite and host. Correct. What is an antigen? Well, it depends on how you define that. If you're the host and a foreign substance comes into you, then it might stimulate your immune system. Can it perhaps, be a protein? It can be a protein. Can it be a sugar? It can be a sugar. Can it be a nucleic acid? It can be a nucleic right. acid. So an antigen is not just a protein. No, it's, an, it's a foreign chemical signature. Best way to put it. A foreign chemical signature that your body has absolutely been programmed to respond to. May I have your signature? <laughs> you may, may I have your chemical signature? <laughs> Here, I'll just put my finger on your... Your, your computer, and you've got it. That's, That's my right. DNA. That's right there. You know, there's probably DNA. I know. I'm not joking. So an antigen is something that a organism an immune recognizes. Response is, yeah, and response it makes an immune response oh, but to of course. it. Right? But and of so course. he said sharing antigens. That implies, of course, that from the part of the parasite's perspective, hosts shed things that might be antigenic to them. Right. Now, let's let's bring it to the <clears throat> to the absurd. We'll reduce it to the absurd. Please, parasites, that's what this program is great for. Pla- parasites have glucose molecules, and so do we. Is that mimicry? No. Why not? Keep going. It has to be an antigenic mimicry. Glucose could be antigenic. I don't know of one single antigen that involves glucose. They're but if all you weird coupled sugars. it to a BSA, I bet it could be antigenic. I don't think so. I don't think it's happening. But just in principle, what I'm I'm trying to just establish a principle. Even the simplest molecules, if they were antigenic, they could be shared. But in fact, in this paper, they expand it beyond antigenicity. They make they functional analogies. So do. let's talk about what, may I? You may. What they define in this paper as mimicry. Please. We refer here to molecular mimicry as the display of any structure by the parasite that one resembles structures of the host at the molecular level. Structures. So that usually involves proteins. Not necessarily. I wouldn't read that into it. I said usually. (laughs) Okay, fine. I'll give you the benefit of seniority. (laughs) Of senility, you mean. (laughs) And two, confers a benefit to the parasite because of this resemblance. Right. So glucose doesn't confer any benefit. None. That's pretty neutral. Pretty neutral. All right. So then they say, what good is mimicry? And they list three things. The Number first one. Is, is camouflage. Right. Do you understand what that means? Of course I do. Okay. We've discussed it already, Vince, with when? regards to schistosomes, remember? Yeah, remind us. We, we talked we about the decorated crab. The that lives in the coral crab. Reef. Are you serving decorated crab for Thanksgiving? <laughs> You'll find out because you're coming over. <laughs> if you do, you won't be able to recognize it. It'll look like a turkey. <clears throat> so this crab lives in a coral reef, and it, it, when it's young, it it takes living polyps of various corals and sticks them onto its carapace, mm-hmm. and they grow there. And as the crab grows older, these organisms grow up with it until the f- crab looks identical to the surroundings. Right. And it just sits there motionless until something edible swims by and then it lurches so the out. So the crab is mimicking the surroundings. It is. It's not molecular mimicry, but it's, no. it gives us a, pe- a sort I'm, of example. I'm using this as a metaphor. Yeah, it's a metaphor. So the schistosome, as we really call, coats itself with human serum proteins. Correct. And disappears off the radar screen from our immune system. So that's, so that's camouflage. That's camouflage. But right. it's not biomimicry because biomimicry would mean that it had an innate molecule of its own that looked like the hosts. Well, I think that they're restricting it to cases where the parasite coats itself with a component of the host, which it either steals from the host or it makes to duplicate what the host has. I, if, it's getting We're getting uh, I know, but, into cases of nomenclature here. But if it does it that way, though, Vince, then it doesn't need to have an identical molecule to the host. It has to have a coupling molecule that allows it to attach host molecules to but the, the point is that it has to use a host to, to camouflage itself. Well, it's, so it won't be immunologically recognized, right? That's correct. All right, that's the issue. But another another way of doing it would be, of course, if the organism expressed a host molecule on its own surface through its own genetics that mimicked a host molecule of immune recognition importance. Mm-hmm. So there are some examples of that. Okay. It's just the sums. We can come back to that. Uh-huh. They make a, a micro... A beta two microglobulin like molecule, okay, from their own genome, which actually mimics the uh, macrophage recognition molecule necessary to initiate an immune response. 
Okay. Did we talk about that? We did. We did. All right. We so did. we can refer you to the Schistosome TWIP. That's correct. If you want to hear more about that. But you've exactly. probably all listened to it already. Exactly. Right? Exactly. We've all listened to everything. All right. Then the third, that's the second potential benefit is what they call cytoadherence. Uh-huh. Does it mean anything to you in the it, parasite world? Of course it does, Vince. Of course it does. Yeah, I mean, I'm asking you this so that not. So we can you take can, the so audience teach, back. So you can teach. Yeah. <laughs> or so I can try to remember when I did that. <laughs> I think he's quizzing me, everybody. No, no, I'm not quizzing you. So, it's a didactic mechanism. That's right. The moment you can go back to the... Or, uh, or is it Socratic? <laughs> Socratic. <laughs> it's Socratic, all right. I'm, what is didn't. Just give me the hemlock, for Christ's sake. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, I don't remember, know why I'm, I'm just so no, it doesn't matter. diverged it doesn't, today. It's fine. It, it's a cloudy day outside. It's kind of a... It's a fuzzy. It's fuzzy out there. The uh, way in which malarial parasites attach to red cells. Remember, we discussed the Duffy blood group yeah. substance and how that related to Plasmodium vivax. And in the absence of the Duffy blood group substance, vivax cannot attach to the red cells. But another lookalike parasite can. Do you remember the name of that one, Vince? See, now I can reverse the tables. What do you mean reverse the tables? You want to dump my table over here? <laughs> it's called Plasmodium ovale. And so Plasmodium ovale... I see, I didn't have to answer by, I, by diverting you. I didn't. can <laughs> still infect a Duffy blood group negative red cell because it, it doesn't depend on that for its adherence. So you're talking about a malaria protozoan coating itself with a host protein in order to attach to... No, 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 I didn't say that. I didn't say Duffy, that. The Duffy substance? That's on the red cell. That's not on the, the parasite. And the parasite attaches to it? Yes, that's right. Okay. They have two others here. They have uh, T. cruzi adhering to fibroblasts by the fibronectin receptor. Okay. And P. falciparum uh, adherence uh, of the erythrocyte infected with P. falciparum ah, that's right. to microvascular endothelium. Using a histidine-rich protein, which lies just under the yes. surface of the red cells. But, but there's another protein that I wish they would have referred to on the sporozoite, which recognizes the um, molecule on the surface of the... I, I think it's on... Um, why am I blocking on this name now? Because it's something that I use all the time. It's bigger than a bread box. <laughs> I'm going from flipping through my Rolodex here of all the vessels. <laughs> um, oh, come on. We're going to block this out and put this in afterwards because I'll No, people that. have to know how inept you are. No, well, they already know that. <laughs> Believe me, we've read the email. <laughs> we are both. It's okay. Uh, You're in good company. <laughs> sinusoids. The In the liver? Yeah, that's right. The mm-hmm. the sporozoites uh, attach first to the sinusoids, and they use a specific receptor molecule in order to do that. Okay. Just like a virus would attack to uh, attach to a, a, a normal cell okay. by using neuraminic acid. I think it's something. kind of a broader uh, definition of mimicry. Yeah. I've never heard it used that way. That is, if a parasite needs to attach to a host, and it and ninety nine percent of them can't, and this one can, and the only reason it can is because it possesses the missing molecule that it uses to yeah. attach to. Then I guess that's an example of what they're okay. saying. You know, it's it does the the names we give things are not always. So it's important. a little fuzzy, but I mean, when you think of the parasite like Toxoplasma gondii, which can penetrate virtually every cell in the body, what does that tell you, Vince? Can attach to uh, common molecules? No. It, well, it has to it, attach before it can penetrate. Not necessarily. No. That's the point. Maybe I, this I parasite know. doesn't need to attach. You think? Are you telling me it's just bumping into a cell and getting in? That's what I'm trying to tell you. You know, viruses don't do that. I know they don't. They're too polite. I mean, if it were based <laughs> on random collisions, it would be very inefficient. Do you know any Maybe viruses be, that may, infect all the cells of the body? I, I think pox viruses are quite wide tropism. And aren't they coated with an envelope? Yeah, I know, but they do bind receptors, though. They okay. don't just, no virus just bumps in. And All right. Well, Toxo has little penetrating organelles mm-hmm. that it can go right through. It's an apicomplexa, just like the plasmodium. All right. A third reason for mimicry go on. is host signaling. Aha. Uh-huh. So, what do they Does that make you, sense to you? It doesn't, it doesn't. It depends on how they use it. <laughs> if they want to disrupt signals that would complete a circuit 
which would enable the host to complete an immune response against the parasite, that's a very good reason for sending out nonsense molecules that interrupt the signaling process. Okay. Is, is that what they mean? Yeah, so for example, they say they could mimic hormone receptors uh-huh. and that way uh, respond to signals. So the host makes a hormone and the parasite binds it and it does something to the parasite. Right. Or they says it, the parasites could also mimic hormones and so bind to receptors in the host and send signals, all of which would be beneficial to them in some way. They could. Uh, by the way, some of these parasites secrete high levels of serotonin. That's different. And they live in the gut. And serotonin is a, is a neuropeptide. So that's they they make serotonin. They do. So that's not mimicking it. They actually make it. They make it. Yeah. Here they're saying mimicking. Right. And they quote an example: functional homologs of the mammalian epidermal growth factor. Cool. Are described in trypanosomes and helminths. Okay. Plasmodia possess surface proteins with EGF motifs. So epidermal growth factor does what it would sound like. Stimulate cells to reproduce. Sure. So you can imagine that parasites would like this to happen under certain conditions, right? I would imagine that, yes, indeed. And then they talk about extreme cases of behavioral manipulation Uh, of the host by the parasite. Uh, And they they cite this thing, which I think you've talked about. Toctoplasma. Suicidal diving of grasshoppers infected with... (laughs) Hair worms. <laughs> okay, but and I didn't they, discuss and they that. They say one yet. <laughs> molecular mimicry is likely to play a role. I didn't discuss that one. Do you know that? No, I don't know. No, that these one. are hair worms. They in, they infect the grasshopper and they make right. them go in the water, which the hair worm needs. The grasshoppers wow. usually don't like to do that. And trout the, gra- eat the grasshoppers, <laughs> yeah, the grasshoppers <laughs> jump in the water, <laughs> right. And the hair worms can get out and do their thing. Got it. We'll put but a link to that. Toxoplasma like. induces a misbehavior in mice. Yeah. So they lose their sense of smell. And it and their fear of cats disappears. Does that involve mimicry of some kind? I'm not sure. They don't cite it here. We don't know what the mechanism is here. They do say that schistosomes send immunosuppressive signals as neuropeptides to both men and uh, humans and snails. So that's part of their mimicry. All right. So they've really scoured the literature for examples of these. Uh, yeah, they have a whole litany of examples. The first biome. evidence was. Uh, anisere that cross-react with parasite and host. So if you make anti- anisere against a parasite and it cross-reacts with the host, that suggests that there's some mimicry involved. The host, the parasite has some antigens that are present in the host, and that could contribute to pathology. Yep. If you make antibodies against your own tissues because you true. think you're making them against the parasite, Very then true. boom. Very true. Uh, what, and there are a bunch of other schistosomes and fasciola hepatica, which is? The liver fluke. Fluke some common antigens. So what they wanted to do here is to develop a computational approach to identify candidate mimicry between parasites and humans. Because now we have what that facilitates this, Dixon? We have the complete sequence of the parasite. Right. Their DNA sequence is now known. And? And we have the complete sequence of the host. Exactly. So now you can match them up. Yes. And you can say, are there common sequences? So right. what they did here is to restrict mimicry to what we call linear amino acid sequences. Just protein, because mimicry, as we said before, could occur at other molecular levels. Looking By the way, was this with or without the Wolbachia? <laughs> because Brugia malei has a Wolbachia symbiont. Yeah, they didn't. They didn't consider the Wolbachia. That's a very interesting. It does. It has. Yeah, Wolbachia all of the in filaria. It, yeah. All of the filaria have Wolbachia. Did we talk about that? We talked a little about that with Honka Circa. We do a paper or two on Wolbachia. Vince, Vince is, loves Wolbachia. What Vince. do you think? I I do too. I I think we should. Yeah. Wolbachia has emerged as a big controller agent. I, I think it's very cool. I think I've become enamored with endosymbiosis. I'm just amazed. As a virologist. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> yesterday on TWIM, we did a paper on these small worms that are found in the sand right offshore, and they are packed with bacteria. 
they're full. They're just basically a tube full of bacteria. These worms have no mouth and no anus, no digestive tract. They're packed full of bacteria that make all the nutrients for the worm. What kind of worms are they, Vince? Catenula, paracatenula. No, no, what, what do they belong to? Catenula species. Are they oligochetes? I don't or know, Dixon. Polychetes? I'm sorry. Or <laughs> I don't know. But listen to the TWIM episode, and you won't find that out. I know. But they take hydrogen sulfide. Oh, yeah. They're and tube worms? They live down in the vents? No, these are no. living in the sand oh, okay. at the surface, okay, and they okay. convert it to okay. sulfur, and they allow. Well, they use it. They, they oh. let the host use it as an electron acceptor, and they make carbohydrates with it. Very cool. Symbiosis. Why did I? Oh, Wabaki. That's why I talked right. about. It. So in this paper, they do a, an in silico analysis of all these sequences, the human genome, and a number of different parasites. Right. They start with full length proteins. So you have a genome sequence. You can predict all the proteins. You that, can with a computer. You can. It's very easy to do. That's right. Do it. <laughs> I just did it. You want to see it again? <laughs> wow, that was quick. Yeah, Blazing Saddles was one of my favorite movies. They anyway. concentrated on endoparasitic helminths. Endoparasitic helminths. Because they are known masters of evasion. They are my favorites. And host manipulation. Yeah. Give us an example of an endoparasitic helminth. Spiralis. <laughs> Wow, no wonder you like them. <laughs> right off the top of my head. <laughs> is a schistosome also an endoparasitic helminth? It is. How about Brugia malayi? You betcha. Lives oh. in the lymphatic vessels. How about Plasmodium? That's a protozoan, Vince. Yeah, I know. But they that was did, a trick question. They did look at it in this. So they didn't focus on it, but they included it. Right. They Probably looked a at Brugia schistosome Plasmodium. Is plasmodium an endoparasite? Yeah, yeah. of course. So it's okay. Leishmania, cryptosporidium. Why do you think they picked... Trichomonas it. and trypanosomes. Yeah, well, there's a reason for this, Vince. I know the answer. Do you want yeah, me I know to you give do. it? Would you, would, would you or please? would you like to give it? Well, I could give it if you'd like. I'd say, oh, Dick, I don't know. What is it? <laughs> it's because those are the only ones that have their complete genome sequences determined. Well, probably there are others, but they had to limit it at some point. Well, those are the published sequences. And then they take the, the predicted proteins of... All of those parasites. They did. That's a big job, though, isn't it? It's a how huge long would job. that take? You know, that's not my field. And so, how long would it take a group like this to actually run those analyses? Probably would take hours of computing. Time. Hours? Yeah. Gee, that long. Well, I, I, you know, I'm not talking about sitting down and putting the the data together for hours. I'm a talking blast. About, I'm talking about computational time. I am too. I mean, how much computer you time? Know, you know, you turn it on before you go home, and you wake up the next day, and it's all done. Yeah, I don't. They don't actually tell us. All they do is they say it was computationally intensive. So when computer people say that, it could take days. You 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 turn it on. You say compare these, and you come back days later. I don't know. I'm, I just don't know, Dixon. And there are algorithms for doing all. Well, of these they things. they they there are what's called blast p, which compares proteins and right, they right. they modified to include all of their uh candidates here got it um and then so they let them run so they again predicted proteins of human versus these endo and they're doing it to try to find new examples of these three ways of avoiding the immune so response. they're doing it for a very restricted reason they want to find similar proteins in the parasites and in humans biomimicry at the molecular level right and these are just going to be linear uh, sequences it. Now, when you make antibodies against the protein, yes. these antibodies can recognize linear stretches of amino acids. It's called an epitope. That's right. Eight or 12 amino acids. Yep. But there are also conformational epitopes. And by that you mean, Vince, that they means, were Catholic and they got confirmed? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> oh, man. We're on a roll here. <laughs> it is. The protein or the amino acids fold in three dimensions, right. and the actual folding uh, is recognized by the antibody. But and not you, the linear structure. No, it's less, much less the linear. Obviously, the linear structure contributes to the folding, but you could, uh, you could not predict it just from the sequence. No. So here they can't look at those folding. And how many uh, of, a, of a given antigenic protein, like bovine serum albumin, for instance, of all the epitopes contained in that protein, how many of them do you think are conformational versus linear? Just as a wild guess. I don't know, because uh, linear, well... I mean, how much are they missing? You know, in polio, there are, there are a handful of linear 
epitopes in the capsid, and there are a handful of uh, structural A handful. Epitopes. So that's they a, have to be on the surface of the protein so the it. antibody can attach to them. Sure, so you're going to miss 50% of you your... You could miss half of them. You could miss, and who knows which are the important ones. So this is a limited approach, but it, computationally... Okay. just have to know that. The way right. you would get at the conformational epitopes would be to compare the structures. Of course. But we don't have the 3D structures we of don't. all these proteins. We will someday after you and I are long gone. I guess. But then you could compare those, and that would be another study. But now they limit it to being linear. Okay? Right, right. Have I made myself clear? To me, at least, you have. So <laughs> The email will tell you whether They identify <laughs> a number. In fact, they identify a number of proteins in each of these parasites that look similar to some human proteins. Cool. I'll give you an example. Please. Brugia. There was one protein uh -huh. that has strong similarity to a human protein called SOX5. Now, how strong a similarity, Vince? This is the whole protein? Uh, it's the whole protein, but there are particular sub-portions of the protein which have this strong homology. Okay, what is SOX5 then? SOX5 is your, what you it wear means on you your feet. Six, you wear them on your if feet. If you only have five, you're missing a SOX? <laughs> You're missing a sock. There are a number of socks proteins. They're called suppressors of cytokine signaling. Ah, that sounds important. All right. So when you make an antibody, sorry, when you make an immune response yes. to a pathogen, yes. you remember the first response is an innate response. Of course. You make interferons and other cytokines. Right. These are soluble molecules that alerts the immune alerts system the immune, that something right. is going on. We have suppressors to make sure it doesn't get out of control. Exactly. We regulate everything. Right, we do. I say we, but... We're control freaks. You know, we don't even think about it. That's right. And so these SOX proteins are regulators of the cytokine response. All if right. you don't have them, if you take them out of mice, they get all kinds of problems. Hmm. In fact, one of these, an investigator here years ago knocked out the gene for one of these SOX proteins in mice, and they got diabetes. Oh, my goodness. Because the mice were making uncontrolled responses, and, and it was they, destroying their... I mean, my increase. goodness. My goodness. Yeah. So this has some homology, so maybe it's a way that Brugia is Can dampen the immune response. doing something. But um, I yeah. must I must say exactly, this exactly that would be it. So part of my uh, literature research also turned up uh, papers on how Brugia manages to stay alive so long inside of a human host. Did we talk about Brugia? We didn't. We no, but which area we did, but we didn't discuss the mechanisms by which they are long lived. But there's a, a, a wonderful investigator who um, is an old-time friend of mine. His name is Thomas Nutman, mm -hmm. and he works at the NIH. And he publishes papers routinely on the immune mechanisms uh, and filariasis. And one of his big themes is that the infection dampens hyporesponsiveness. He uses this term hyporesponsiveness for the entire immune system. Both T and B cell mediated yeah. immune how responses. Does, how does it do that? Exactly. It's how does it do that? Interesting. Hmm. And so this might be an attempt to start to come to grips with that. Now there is one problem here. Tell us what that is, Vince. Just one? <laughs> well, <laughs> I can see several, but go well, ahead. This protein that they identified in uh, Brugia yep. is not known to be secreted. <laughs> oh, geez, that's too bad. So if it were to have the activity which we suggested yeah. that is suppressing immune responses... How would it do it? Yeah. So they say, oh... Maybe. That must be a red herring then. It could be. But it would be very easy to make this protein, the parasite protein, and ask, does it have some suppressor activity? Not a, not a hard experiment to do. No. And if it did, then you'd have to figure out how it got out of... Right. Maybe when they break open as the parasites die? No, that's crappy, right? At that point, it releases the immune system to completely yeah, destroy the parasite that's already dead. So they come up with a number of candidates for each parasite for, for plasmodium. They have so 96 a, proteins that can pick up something in the human protein. Vince, I served on a study section, and so did you, and we heard this term again and again and again. Fishing. There you go. But it's you a, like fishing. It's a fishing expedition. And, you know, I used to raise my hand and say, I do this very well, guys. Come on, I Good. love to you fish. You should defend it. It is called discovery-based Science. Well, they have a new name for it. <laughs> what is it? Yes. No, the discovery based Yeah, well, that's what we do. We want to call it fishing expedition. It's not a fishing expedition anymore. No, no, but Dixon, I think you should let scientists do what 
excites them because that's the way you find good things. And would you the pay game. them to do this, Vince? I would pay them, and then after five years, if uh, nothing interesting came out of it, then no more. Isn't this interesting? I think it's interesting. I think that the experiments need to be done now. Right. These are all in silico, uh-huh. right? In silico, meaning... So we have now a number... Silicon Valley, or just... <laughs> <laughs> it's done in a computer. Right. You're just comparing sequences. Right. And you're coming up with proteins that are similar. Leads. You're what, asking for leads. What does it mean? Now, they, let's get to the end of this, okay? They do it with whole proteins, and then they say epitopes are often short. So let's break up each of these predicted let's, proteins yeah. for both the parasite sure, and sure. the host to 14 amino acid long pieces, which even is more computationally intensive. And they do that, and they get even more Because there are more possibilities, yeah. So they end up with, for each parasite, about 100 or 200 protein wow. sequences that are similar to those in humans. Wow. So they, then you could say which ones are secreted, which ones are not. You could do it that way, you too. You could do that, exactly. You so could you look in the literature and know if there is anything that supports that protein being involved. Or in you mimicry. could synthesize them and then inject you them could. into a host and see if it alters the infection. So this is sort of stimulating research, isn't Got it? it? I think it is. But they're not saying what to do. What they have no. done is put all these results in a public database right. that anybody could access. Right. And you could say if, there's, if they had done trichinella, did they hear? No. They its genome not. isn't quite finished yet. No, it's not on the list. No, it's not quite finished. So what they've got is Brugia, Cryptosporidium, Giardia, Schisto. Leishmania, Plasmodium, Schisto, Trichomonas, Trypanosomes. Yeah, those okay. are the ones that have been They also did some list. mosquitoes, Egypti, Gambia. Right, those have been sequenced too. And a few controls. Yeah. And they put all the hits yeah. into a public database so that people yeah. can go, and if you're working on these organisms, you go, oh, I work on that protein. Let's, I have an antibody. Let's check it out. So this is facilitating research. Right. So you couldn't have done this study. No. no. They've done it. Correct. And I think as more sequences are generated, they'll probably do some more and put it in. And it's a good service. Sure. I'm sure it's not the only thing they do. Right. So we're at the stage now of a crime investigation, crime scene investigation. CSI. So here's the, the parasitologist is the detective, and he is now, or she, is... Asking the same question to all of these supposed witnesses or parasites and collecting the data, they take them back and then they analyze and then they go out and ask different questions a second time and then different questions and, ah, there it is, I've found it. So we're now at the first stage of investigation. So that's what whole genomic data means to the field of parasitology. And that's a great deal, by the way. So the more you get, the more you'll know. Until finally you'll get them all because there's so much in common with each one of them, the nuance. You could walk this right up just like they did from E. coli to Neurospora to Cenorhabditis to Drosophila to the mouse to the human. That's, those were the first genomes to ever be sequenced. And now you've got groups of parasites being sequenced. Mm-hmm. And so you can get with Trypanosoma cruzi. I wonder how close Trypanosoma cruzi genome is to Trypanosoma brucei. I don't know the answer I, offhand, I, but it's there. We could find out. I don't know the answer. I don't, I'm not sure if brucei has been sequenced completely yet or not. I'm not certain. But I know they have lots of similarities. So by subtracting the similar regions out first, you don't have to sequence that part. You can just sequence the differences by subtractive hybridization. So it's an interesting world we live in, Vince, because you said that we'll long be dead before they find these answers. You know, it might be next year and they found the answers. I hope we're not dead be. by next year. No, I hope not, but you never know. But it's soon. possible. I mean, because every time you look around, the data has increased by tenfold. It's almost like the same paradigm for the speed of a computer. Every 18 months, it doubles in speed. Yes, but Isn't that I, I, Maxwell's I, um, laws or something like that? Soon this? it will cease because the budget... <laughs> are really I cutting know. into science, oh, I know, and I know, I know, I know. long term, it's going to be going down in the U.S. We're I really, know. we're really dismantling the science establishment. Yeah, we are. It's unfortunate because we can do so much now, and the thing is, science really makes people healthier. It makes technology go forward. Correct. It, it contributes to, so much to it, society. It, it jumpstarts whole industries. I mean, look at what the nanotechnology industry has gone into. It's really unfortunate. That's just a couple of years. Anyway. Um, it is, a, oh, you're right. it is a list of experiments, and it could be that of these few hundred proteins or thousand 
similarities. Only one is real. Maybe none are real. Right. Maybe dozens are real, but right. it remains to be seen. So this data is open to anybody else to come along yeah, and try they can, this. Yeah, you can get to this database. So a drug sure. company might be interested in this. Absolutely. Absolutely. You bet. And they're probably looking at it as we speak. Let's hope so. All right, email. Email. The first one is from Howie, who writes, Great podcast. A while ago, Dick made a comment along the lines that Sir Ronald Ross was a dim <laughs> bulb. That was his term, not mine. I want I want the record to clearly show that I would have never used that term. You do, <coughs> you do it offline. I do. You call me a dim bulb all the time. Oh, that's different. <laughs> Ross did much more than just discover that bird malaria is transmitted by mosquitoes. He right. was a closet mathematician. Uh huh. And published about 20 papers and books on pure math, and he puts a link to one of his papers. He was also a superb infectious disease transmission modeler. Yes. Germ theory was developed in the 1850s by... Coke and postulates. (laughs) Before then, people believed that diseases such as cholera were caused by a miasma, a noxious form of bad air. About 60 years later, Ronald Ross, a public health physician developed two ordinary differential equation transmission models for malaria that made the following predictions. One, one does not need to kill all the mosquitoes in an area to prevent malaria epidemics. There is a threshold value of vector capacity below which the disease quickly dies out in humans. This conclusion was at first rejected by the experts, but proved correct by field trials in Malaysia, where malaria transmission essentially ceased after draining the mosquito larval habitats. Two, malaria cannot be eradicated by treating humans alone. Even if the number of infected humans is reduced by 99%, if the mosquito population remains unchanged, then the disease prevalence will rebound to its former value. Mm. And three, the endemic level of infections is lower for longer-lasting infections, e.g. it is lower for P. vivax than for P. falciparum infections. Wow. So uh, can I just correct one thing here? What I... I would, if I called him a dim bulb, I didn't mean to say that. What I meant to say, if I did say that, but I, I don't think I use that term, was that Ronald Ross was, in medical school at least, an underachiever. He didn't try hard. He might have been brilliant, but he didn't want to waste his time with medicine because he was probably bored with it because they didn't know that much about it to begin with. So he, he was a C plus student. That's what I said, I hope. But later on, he became famous, of course, because he was brilliant. And he was insightful. In fact, he became the editor-in-chief for the British Medical Journal and was responsible, by the way, for naming Lishmania Donovani. Lishmania cool. Donovani, because both Leishman and Donovan sent separate papers to the British Medical Journal. Right. So Ronald Ross saw both of these to the same parasite and put them together. Mm-hmm. So he's brilliant. He was brilliant. Of course he's brilliant. In fact, there's a whole institute named after him now, so... And they wouldn't do that uh, for a dumb bulb. How he continues, of course, the mathematical models cannot prove anything, but they generated novel hypotheses which were found to be correct and saved countless lives. Ross was also the first to present a mechanistic model of the transmission of a generic infectious disease. Not bad for a dim bulb. <laughs> no, his bulb shone brightly after graduating from medical school. No question about it. Please never stop twiving. I, I presume that's a generic... Twiving or twipping? Twiv, twip, twim. Well, he wrote it to twim, I mean twip. Yeah. He said, never stop twiving, but that's just a generic thing, like don't stop podcasting. Oh. Really Howie is a it. professor of mathematics. Oh, wow. At the Georgia Institute of Technology. I'm impressed that a math professor cool. is listening, but maybe he's, his interest is infectious disease modeling, right? It could be. It very well could be. Next one is from... Sorry, yes. He might be near the Centers for Disease Control, and maybe he consults with them. He's in Atlanta, Next one is from Spencer. Dear Twip, I really enjoyed your analysis of the malaria vaccine article from the New England Journal of Medicine. You guys had an interesting discussion about the different phases of clinical trials, and I thought it was incumbent upon me to clarify these phases. Oh, good. You read, that means you guys screwed it up, and I need to set the record straight. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) That's probably what it means to me, too. As a clinical investigator... I oversee several phase one clinical trials. A phase one trial is a dose escalation trial. Okay. It is simply carried out to assess safety at various potential clinical doses of a compound. Obviously, before a compound makes it to such a trial, there has been some demonstration of effectiveness in animal models or some reasonable suspicion that the compound will be a useful treatment for the disease. 
Phase one studies are small, typically 20 to 80 people, and it is in this phase that side effects can first be seen. Mm -hmm. The phase two trial targets the maximum tolerated safe dose in a specific population that either has the disease or is at risk for the disease. Okay. There are usually 100 to 300 people in a phase two trial. In addition to looking at continued safety at the studied dose, the compound in question is studied for its effectiveness in treating the condition or disease in this phase. Okay, so far, Dixon? So far, so good. In phase three, the compound is compared to standard of care treatment, often in a head-to-head blinded Ah, fashion. Ah, yes. In some cases, there is no defined standard of care treatment. Alternatively, in some cases, such as you discussed about HIV, it would be unethical to withhold conventional treatment while evaluating the new cons- uh, new uh, compound. Yeah, 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 yeah. This makes phase three trials very difficult to complete. Also, phase three trials usually require thousands of participants and take a long try uh, mm-hmm, time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Phase four trials are post-marketing trials. The compound has already been approved for sale and prescription by the FDA. Many of the side effects and sometimes disasters associated with some medications are not apparent until the drug is taken by tens of thousands of people after it is already released. Right. I hope this is helpful to listeners, and I just want to remind you guys that there are still some interesting parasitic life cycles and histories (laughs) to discuss for which we are still waiting. Keep up the great work. Well, maybe I hope you can email us your list of parasites that you'd like to hear about that we haven't talked about because we'd be glad to do it. The next one is from Jim, our friend in Virginia. Okay, Jim. I was jolted to hear the casual mention in TWIP 28 by Dr. Guads of chiggers and scrub typhus. I thought chiggers were one of the local pests I could ignore other than itching during routine encounters with them each summer. Uh. This summer, at the worst point, I had over 50 on two legs, <laughs> despite deet all over my shoes, socks, and lower pant legs. One or perhaps two adjacent bites produced a large blister in contrast with the usual small red itchy nodules. Uh. No other symptoms, but now I'll be alert to associated symptoms. During scrub typhus research with Google, I saw instructions for soldiers about tucking trousers into the tops of their boots as a protective measure. I assume this is the reason for blousing boots done by the Army, but don't recall ever hearing that was the reason. Another great twip, by the way. A small group discussion seems to produce the most interesting results. Here, here. He's saying he doesn't like just two of us. <laughs> He likes to have more than you and I. The, the biodiversity index is pretty low with just the two of us. I, I like I it too. And well, sometimes two is great. We, we will occasionally get a third person. We've actually had as many as six people, haven't we? For TWIP? No, for TWIP. For TWIP, we've had six. That's very tough. That was unwieldy. It's hard. Three is good. Four would be I ideal. did a TWIM yesterday with just one other person. I really yeah, enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah. Conversations. You know what would be great sometime, Vince, to consider? Maybe we can invite one of our listeners and as the third person. Well, that was Victor Gabriel, remember? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Gabriel Victor, sorry. <laughs> he was a listener. And he was. He, he was. No, I mean online as a Skyper. Oh, yeah, sure. We've had that too. Yeah. You mean like a lay person? Yeah. To just ask questions? Or some, some ardent listener that wants to get on the show that uh, submits their name uh, with uh, a good question. We might select them out of a hat and say, if you'd like to Skype with us the next time, come on board. What I'm thinking of one day is having, we do this live. So as we're recording, we broadcast the audio. Right. And then we can have a chat room where listeners can lurk and ask questions. They can type questions. We can see them here. Tweet us. And we can answer them as That would be good, too. Online questions and answers. Yeah. That'd That'd be great. Next one is from Michael. Okay. I love TWIP. Thank you, Michael. I'm starting my parasitology class for a medical lab program this fall. Good deal. I'm also excited to be able to learn and understand many more of the details now that I've had the basics down because of TWIP. I have also enjoyed being able to use all of the TWI podcasts to form questions for my friend in physician assistant school, who then often asks her classmates the same questions. I bring up topics you say are not often taught in medical schools and the unusual cases and put them into a type of case study, adding the most vague hints as she and they get stumped. Nice. Due to your podcast, I will be able to better grasp everything I learn and be able to help impart critical thinking skills to other healthcare professionals. That's a very um, knowledgeable letter that we've just received and 
We accept your uh, praises. I'm not done yet. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but. Also, do I re- <laughs> no, no, no buts. Do I remember hearing that a sixth edition may be coming of the parasitic diseases book? You remember hearing that. It's been slow, but uh, we're still thinking of doing I it. I would love to add that to my studies. If so, any idea when? Did you say it may be available on iBooks? I also encourage you to yeah. consider Kindle for it's easier to read the yep. text on a Kindle. And anyone with a computer, iPad, iPhone, Android, etc., can get the free Kindle app and read it and view any color pictures. Right. Can you give us an update? I can, Vince. Uh, you and I actually, and you know that you could say this as well as I, uh, we are in the process of putting this uh, fifth edition up on the Amazon uh, Kindle version uh, as we speak, probably right. at the end of today. So. Uh, if everything maybe. works well, maybe if it if, works well, yeah. if everything goes well, we'd like to put it up as a PDF because it shows up better that way. Because um, the book is written in two columns with color pictures, et cetera. And, and I, we think we've learned how to do it. So maybe by this time next week, uh, they'll be able to purchase a copy at a minimal weight. Yeah, we we're putting a color version up. So if you're using an iPad or any color device. You'll be able to see it in color. Right. I'm working with you on this. You are. And I don't know a Not lot. Not with me. You're doing most you know, of the work, Vince. We, we um, put up West Nile Story as a Kindle did. book, and that worked, but there were no illustrations there. Here, there are a lot of color, and it's more, more difficult. This is true. But the as for the sixth edition, I would guess it's going to be two years. You'd guess that, huh? Mm. Mm. Let me think about that. I would still like a higher frequency, but so long as you just don't stop, I will be happy with whatever you can do. <laughs> we're not stopping. Anything associated with infectious diseases and how humans interact with and are affected by them is my passion. Thank you for giving me chopped and dried wood to put onto the fire. (laughs) You understand that, Dixon? I do. The next one is from Jim. Again, our friend in Virginia. Incomparable TWIP30. You remember who was on TWIP30? Um, um, oh, oh, yes, uh, Kinersh. Charles. Just incomparable. Pure knowledge. So much expertise in one place. Another podcast in my best podcasts folder. Wow. All the Twiv, Twip, and Twim podcasts are great, but they are readily accessed too. And so far, and I'm capturing a collection of less easily retrieved audio files for times when I can pass on the collection to interested folks, which has already occurred twice. A couple Twips are there to capture attention and alert listeners to where similar files are available. I'm sure your backup plan is excellent, Vince, but I'll happily store copies of everything if you need another remote site. If you have the space, for sure, you never know what building is going to burn down. Jim could be a cloud. Could be a cloud. Are you in the cloud, Jim? (laughs) Alan writes, What creature slash parasite slash worm can I catch from eating a cockroach snack late at night? I can't... Decide which entertainment personality I like more, Vince or Des Palm. Did you know you're D-E-S-P-O-M? Isn't that cool? Whatever. It's not just the subject. It's you guys that I listen to. Oh, brother. Have fun, Alan. P.S. I am with Dixon on the orchids. Do you remember? I do. I made fun of you for going to look at the orchids. That doesn't. He's with you. You can't make fun of me for doing that. I won't take that to heart. Um, Oh, he said, have fun. Signed, Alan. Right. So parasites right. <laughs> that you can catch by eating invertebrates, like uh, in this case a cockroach. Cockroaches are called paratenic hosts, Vince. Do you know what the word paratenic means? No. Nope. I see. Well, not, at least I can teach you something. Okay, so paratenic simply means that it's a passive carrier of that parasite. So if, for instance, a cockroach happened to have walked across and I know this sounds disgusting, but just bear with me here. This is a a medical show, right? It walks across um, a large piece of feces that happens to contain lots of cysts of, let's say, in this case, Giardia lamblia and Entamoeba histolytica. Mm -hmm. Some of the feces will cling to its feet. And as it walks across the feces on its way to the chocolate bar that's sitting on your desk that's half opened, now, don't ask me what a, what a large piece of feces is also doing sitting on your desk, unless you happen to be a parasitologist and you're studying these little beasties, and here comes a roach and it walks across the feces first on its way to the chocolate. When it gets to the chocolate and it starts to munch down on the chocolate, because it really doesn't eat feces, by the way, it prefers sweets. 
then some of these parasites in the form of the cysts or the eggs of these parasites can actually be deposited on the chocolate bar. And uh, then when you eat the chocolate bar, of course, you become infected with those parasites. And they've actually shown this to be the case in some places where the roach populations are incredible and fecal contamination is high and the contamination with food is also high. He, 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 he's eating the cockroach. I know he is. Oh, okay. Well, that's even worse. So on the feet of this cockroach, if you, <laughs> it yeah. depends on where the roach has been. Now, you should you know, have a little sign up on your wall with a picture of a roach on it and say, do you know where this roach has been? Do not put this in your mouth because roaches will live in all kinds of weird places. Are there known parasites of roaches? There are, but they're not parasites of people. Not hurting us. Not at all. They have Gregorins. Gregorins? Gregorins. What's that? It's a protozoan, very primitive protozoan parasite. Neat. It lives in the gut tract of... Uh, is, this, is, it of produ- this. is it producing something for the cockroach? We don't know that. And it also contains a lot of nematode parasites that live in their gut tracts. In I fact, know there are lots of bacteria in the guts of cockroaches. Yes, that's true. And they have viruses within them. Interesting. Interesting. I mean, cockroaches, they come in all sizes and shapes, right? The wood roach is an enormous roach, about so big, Vince. It's about yeah, three big. or four inches long. Yep, yep. And there are hissing roaches that they show in... Uh, do they really hiss? They do, they do. <laughs> they, Can you they show imitate? Them Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> you know? Like this? Yes. That kind of hissing, really? Yes, that's true. And then there are, of course, the large American cockroaches. That I think Bob Gwatz actually talked about this a little bit on his podcast. The uh, Maybe, American yeah. cockroach, Periplaneta americana, and then there's the German cockroach, Blatella germanica, and then there's the Oriental cockroach, Blatella orientalis. Why do you know so much about cockroaches? Because I'm a very good friend of Bob Gwatz's, and <laughs> that's all he talks about when we're together. No, cockroaches? That's no, that's not true, but but he's taught me a lot, and, and I've through the years I've picked this up from him. And also, by the way, I had a great course here at Columbia from a guy by the name of Roger Williams, well, I think I've talked about him earlier. In this. He was a medical entomologist, and I learned a great deal about uh, mosquitoes and uh, mm-hmm. cockroaches and things like that from him, too. So thank God I haven't forgotten some of that. The next one is from Scott, who okay. says, Hi, guys. This article popped up on a Facebook feed I subscribe to. Probably you already are familiar th- with the material, but just in case... I thought I would pass it along. Thank you, Scott. I have an interest but no expertise in tropical medicine and would like to hear your opinions. Would you like to see the article, Dixon? I would love to see the article, Vince. Whole whole parasite malaria vaccine shows promise in clinical trial. Right, that's the Steve Hoffman one. This we talked about last time a bit, right? We did. You said it was uh, injected and that might not be... Well, it was injected intramuscularly and the parasite is actually an intravenous injected parasite because the mosquito does that. So the root of infection and the root of injection might have a lot to do with how the outcome is. Right, so we'll refer you to TWIP32. At the very beginning, we had a discussion of that. Yeah, we discussed both of those. But thank you. I just wanted to acknowledge that we did do that, Scott. Thanks, Scott. Ricardo sends an article to us. Ricardo is our friend. He's a professor in Portugal. Okay. Do you know where that is? I do. It's right next to Spain. It's an article in Fast Company called Big Pharma Giving Away Drug Patents to Help Cure Tropical Disease. Hmm. Many of these big companies are giving away some of their intellectual property in a collaboration between the World Intellectual Property Organization, BioVentures for Global Health. They're taking a intellectual property that can aid to treat tuberculosis, malaria, Chagas disease, and dengue. Hmm. So it's a very short article, but we'll post that. Is that uh, organization that's receiving the intellectual property, is that a San Francisco-based organization by any chance? And I would be familiar with it otherwise. I don't know. It's not obvious offhand. No, because uh, one company had a cure for baldness that was also the cure for leishmaniasis. (laughs) And they charged (laughs) an arm and a leg for the drug for baldness, of course. And they knew that it had uh, biological activity against, uh, I believe it was leishmaniasis as well. So this organization obtained the rights to use the drug almost for free, for the leishmaniasis uh, in India. There was a pocket of it in India. Mm. And they went in and knocked it out by using this drug. 
I think it's a good idea to do this. You need yeah. to help these com- countries that can't afford it, right? You know, it pays you back because then you can sell them all kinds of things if they can live long enough to pay for it. I mean, if you if you were <laughs> entrepreneurial in this sense, that's a good point. Yeah, you know, the more customers there are out there, the better off you're going to be. Let's do well at least one more. Let's see how sure, long it takes. On. Maybe one more. Maybe two. Maybe this one's from Alex. Hello, Doctor Arakinello and De Pommier. Curious if you might have some insights on a particular malaria life cycle. Hmm. I've been reading on Plasmodium vivax. Okay. We know that vivax can relapse via the hidden agents stored in the liver termed hypnozoites. Correct. But time and time again through multiple sources, it's stated that vivax malaria relapses much more quickly in patients in tropical regions over non-tropical regions on the magnitude of several months. For the life of me, I cannot explain this. The parasite would seemingly detect the same body temperature and conditions within the host regardless of where they are living. I have two theories here. Perhaps the hosts are indeed different with varied levels of nutrition and other factors causing the hypnozoites to convert earlier in tropical cases and later in better nourished non-tropical cases. Or, on the other hand, the cases of relapses could be muddled by actual cases of reinfection. Since you are more likely to get an infection in a tropical region, the relapse rates seem lower in non-tropical regions. Any thoughts? I agree with your second reason entirely. I think if you live in a tropical region where Vivax is being transmitted and you catch one infection, the likelihood is that you'll catch another infection sometimes too. So this makes now the number of hypnozoites double over what it would be with a mm. single infection. Mm-hmm. And the more reinfections you have, and remember there's no lasting immunity against this parasite, that right, right. every transmission season you can acquire it. Uh, it makes good sense to say that people living in endemic areas have a higher rate of relapse, but it might not be from the same infection. You might get relapses from two or three different infections. Okay. That's a good, that's excellent. That's fantastic. Next part. Yep. In TWIP 31, Dr. Despommier mentioned that a man by the name of McGregor conducted a statistical analysis to determine the number of cases needed to maintain malaria infection within the population. I did say that. I was unable to find this paper and curious if you might be able to link in the show notes next time. Okay. We can look it up when we're done. We will. I'm extremely interested to see these figures. It seems to me that we might be on the cusp of a medical paradigm with a vaccine that's 50% effective. It may be the extra push with the combination of mechanical preventive strategies, bed nets, etc., needed to eradicate the disease. Right. Is there such a thing as vector-based herd immunity? Conventionally, 85% of individuals within a population must be immune to maintain herd immunity within the entire population. I know this is complicated by the fact that it must be essentially eradicated within two populations, humans and mosquitoes, and therefore likely to result Mm -hmm. in a much higher threshold of immunity. There's a wonderful example of herd immunity to vec- against vectors with regards to onchocerciasis, which is a black fly transmitted infection, as we will recall from one of our TWIPs. And uh, in endemic centers that had extremely high rates of this infection, it was almost impossible for the black flies to become reinfected or infected because they... They, ing- they ingested so many microfilaria that they ended up killing off the vectors. That's how heavily infected the people mm. were. So you, you can have that happen. And that doesn't happen with malaria, as far as I know, but it did happen with regards to onchocerciasis. Keep up the great work. Thank you. All right, one more. Sure. Todd writes, I'm reading this article and take a small issue with item number five. Let me show Dixon the article. It's in Life Hacker. 10 more stubborn food myths that just won't die debunked by science. Okay? (laughs) Yes. So, he has a problem with number five. Number five. The first part of this paragraph makes perfect sense. If it's parasites or other risks associated with sushi that worry you more than mercury. Andy Bellati suggests you put your mind at ease. Fish served in sushi restaurants has been previously flash frozen, which kills parasites as effectively as cooking, he explains. Correct. Particularly confusing to me, though, and if memory serves, contrary to a comment that Dick made about farmed fish, though I think it was in reference to a sheep-born parasite, liver fluke maybe, is the second part of the paragraph. Andy also points to Stephen Shaw's book, Asian Dining Rules, Essential Eating Strategies for Eating Out at Japanese, Chinese, Southeast Asian, (laughs) Korean, and Indian Restaurants. (laughs) 
<laughs> I'm sure that's a bestseller. <laughs> Which explains that most fish used for sushi in restaurants around the world are farmed to avoid the problems with parasites in wild fish. Let me just, uh, now I can really talk about this. If you I, just, well, let me finish reading. Uh, right? Sure, sure, sure. Fish like tuna are not particularly susceptible to parasites because they dwell in very deep and cold waters. That's a quote. Sushi restaurants typically use farmed salmon to avoid the parasite problems wild salmon have, he explains. The fish that are at times likely to have parasites like cod or other whitefish aren't used for sushi anyway and are generally served fully cooked. I suspect it is more about which parasite they're referring to than the absolute of all parasites. But can you clear up my confusion? I will try. I will try. Okay, let's start with the original observations back in the 1950s in Holland with regards to, uh, not sushi in this case, this was green herring, or green herring. Green herring were, were herring that were caught in the uh, North Atlantic, right, in between England and, let's say, the, well, yeah, England and the mainland of, of, of Europe, and brought back fresh on the boats and briefly pickled, or brined, as they call it, brining, and then the green herring cart would go through the marketplaces of Amsterdam, uh, serving Heineken <laughs> and Amstel beers, which was great, with an almost live pickled herring. And the herring was not cleaned, okay? That was, it wasn't cut open and the guts were not removed first. And so what, what they started to encounter were these uh, massive outbreaks of uh, acute abdominal pain, which had the reminiscence of appendicitis, but which turned out to be due to this little anisacid parasite. An anisacid parasite is related to ascaris. Okay, the ascaris that we commonly think of in people is as big as a pen. The ascaris that live inside of cetaceans, that is, pinnipeds, that seals, uh, walruses, uh, orcas, okay, uh, and whales, uh, they get them by eating these fish. And the larva of their adult parasites lives inside the gut tract of these fish. And if we encounter the parasite as a larva, the larva immediately detects the fact that we are not a cetacean, and they try to get out of us by penetrating through our stomach wall. Okay, and here they are. So that's that was the first lesson that the green herring people learned. Of course, they, <laughs> they eliminated the problem by catching all the green herring. Uh, and now there's a herring shortage, uh, so they don't have to worry about this problem anymore. But flash freezing the herring would kill the larvae inside the gut. After they thawed it back out again, there was no problem. So the next time this occurred was in sushi houses because obviously sushi became a very fashionable um, cuisine. And so <clears throat> the fish that were commonly used in sushi uh, houses were tuna, that's true, uh, not bluefin but yellowtail, and uh, there was another uh, kind of tuna that they were using as well. Um, but it's not true that tuna don't catch these parasites because they do. They develop these anisacid worms too, but the relationship of the size of their gut tract to the size of the muscle is so big, and the tuna are so valuable that they're cleaned right away anyway, so that you usually don't encounter this problem in tuna. But other fish, you do. Um, you can get them in any, uh, uh, like mackerel, or uh, the bottom feeders are better, the, t the codfish and uh, plaice, flounder, those sorts of fish. And, and that's not commonly served at most sushi places. So, but every now and then one would show up and people would become turned off and then the newspapers would carry these big stories about worms and your sushi and stuff. And so, in fact, the quietest I've ever had my medical school class get, <laughs> and they all sat down again, was when one lecture I was talking about Ascaris and I was talking about Toxicara and dogs and cats. And then I said, and they all started to get up, and I said, okay, class dismissed. And then I said, oh, wait a minute, I forgot to tell you about sushi. <laughs> and the entire class just sat back down again. The books came open, and they were glued to their, their their professor because they wanted to hear everybody in the audience ate sushi, right, including the professor. So then it became apparent that um, this, this perceived problem wasn't as uh, widespread as it uh, was made out to be, and because of the hype given by the press and everything else. But a... But, uh, a national procedure elicited was elicited from this a recommendation from the uh, the FDA that you should flash freeze the meat before turning it into sushi. So I don't think 
that farm-raised salmon avoids the problem, I don't think. I think flash freezing and flash freezing rather and thawing solves the problem. If you travel, however, to let's say Japan, where this is obviously one of their national cuisines, or to other places that uh, that serve mm -hmm. sushi, they may not flash freeze. Okay. So this is a U.S. thing in Europe, maybe? Flash freezing is a U.S. thing, and I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure that Europe adheres to it as well, but you have to be pretty sophisticated to have a tank of liquid nitrogen sitting around someplace yeah. to dip your fish into, flash freeze it, and take it back out. Why do we flash freeze it rather than putting it in the freezer? Because putting it in the freezer freezes it slowly, and it changes the texture of the meat. Uh, but so it still the, would kill the parasite. Oh, well, right? Of course it would, but you'd have to wait longer. And then, yeah. But flash freezing lets you freeze it, and then it thaws back out, and it hasn't lost any of its consistency. Cool. Nice. Right. So that, that basically solved the problem. And we haven't had, as far as I know, I haven't seen any cases on uh, CDC uh, morbidity mm -hmm. mortality reports or PubMed. I haven't seen any uh, <clears throat> epidemics or outbreaks of, uh, in this case, anisakis worms trying to find their way out of a host that they know they shouldn't be in. All right, he finishes up. Keep up the great work, guys. Twip and Twiv are both part of my commute routine. It makes me wish my drive was longer. <laughs> well, More fossil fuels being burned. No, please don't do that. Well, maybe not, but your penchant for educating the masses is earning you karma points daily. <laughs> Todd, P.S. Ronald Jenkins rocks. You should hear his unreleased music, which he has linked from his website. He has uh, the music I use on Twitter. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's from Ronald Jenkins. Right. One more. I can't resist doing please, one more. Please. This is from Luca. Okay. Once again, I write to offer... Sorry. Once again, I write to you after listening to twip number 32, where Vincent went off on a tangent <laughs> to discover the meaning of acta ah, in yes. various scientific <laughs> journals. <laughs> we Here, tend to do this now. Come on, give us a break. <laughs> Here I am to shine some light upon it. As an Italian, <laughs> I learned that word in primary school when we were taught that every day in ancient Rome... All that had been discussed and decided in the Senate would be put up on a poster in the forum, the public square, so that the people could know about it. Cool. This was called Acta Diurna, or Diurna, loosely record of the day. Of course, there's a Wikipedia page for it. It goes into much more detail than I ever would be able to. I probably got it wrong in some details, too. Primary school was <laughs> a long time ago. Indeed. So Acta means record. Right. Sounds good. Once again, so Acta Virologia, Virological Acta Record. Acta Retract. Once again, thanks for your constant, excellent work in education and public outreach. I have now expanded my weekly podcast schedule to include TWIM, but I have to admit that TWIP is still my favorite. Vince, you're a big man to read that on there. <laughs> Fine. Luca. Luca. It's an Italian name. P.S. Here's an added bonus. I knew the meaning of I knew the meaning of de pommier, uh -huh. but was curious about racaniello. Uh -huh. So I looked it up online. There's no meaning as far as I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> I have no meaning. <laughs> racaniello is meaningless. I don't believe that. Although to me it sounds like some kind of edible root in Italian. <laughs> Gosh. However, I found the racaniello coat of arms in the corresponding Wikipedia page. Did you know about it? And you have a rather mean family motto. Uh-oh. Too. Dominus exquisitus artis seviter quis revocas malum mernet. It means I possess a refined art that to hurt cruelly whoever does me evil. Cheerio. Wow. So yes, I was aware of that. If you search Wikipedia for Rack and Yellow, there are two pages. Wow. One is about me. And the other is about the Rack and Yellow family, a short history of it, and the coat of arms, and this horrible saying, which has nothing to do with me because I'm not evil. I, I always, I always thought that Rack and Yellow meant these little uh, racks that the Torquemada people used to put the uh, heretics on in Spain when they they're shorter than normal people. No, that's not that's not it at all. No, I don't. You ever watch the? Uh, means, actually. Do you ever watch the show, Vince? I'm sure you might, um, in a fit of boredom, turn this on. Called this week in this old house. Okay. This week in this old house. Yeah, this old house has a weekly show. It's called this weekend. And well, it's something like that, but it's, it's, it's sort of like a comp compilation. And one of the episodes that they have always is what is it? 
And they bring out these weird looking devices and they all stand around this device and they try to guess what it is and they make up these funny stories about what it might be. And of course, none of them are right. But um, so it's fun to make up, you know, meanings for our names that have nothing to do with the actual meanings of our names. Well, uh, Luke, uh, if you'd like some more information, uh, Raken Yellow, there are, there are many people, where my father came from, which is from um, the south of, of Italy. It is a town up in the mountains called Castel Grand, and it's in the province of Basilicata. There are many people named Raken Yellow, but I know they're from elsewhere in Italy as well. I own the domain name, rackandyellow.com, by the way, but I never did anything with it. I'd always meant to make it some informational... You can sell it to a rich so, rackandyellow No, I don't need to sell it. Just hold on to it. So that'll do it for email, and that'll do it for TWIP33. How okay. was that? That was a good episode. Good, Vince. But they're all good, Dixon, right? Oh, yeah, I think so. We do this as often as we can, this TWIP podcast. Yep. And we post it on iTunes at the Zoom Marketplace and at microbeworld.org slash TWIP. And you can listen to them there. We suggest you subscribe in iTunes. And if you're new, uh, that will allow you to get the podcast every week. And even if you're old, it will allow you to get the podcast <laughs> every week. But if you are a new subscriber, please leave a comment on iTunes. It helps us stay on the front, yep. front page of the medic medicine section. We also have an app for your cell phone, your iPhone, or Android device that you can use to stream the episodes to. You can find that at microbeworld.org slash twip. Do send us your questions and comments to twip at twiv.tv. Thank you, Dixon de Palmier. Well, very welcome. Vincent's <laughs> Rock and Yellow. You can be found at verticalfarm.com, trichinella.org, and medicalecology.com. And what's the latest? Are you having another website? Oh, that's enough. No, not another website, but. Uh, well, there is one at verticalfarm.com, but, but we've been discussing the possibilities, Vince, of having a This Week in Urban Agriculture. Uh, we need to have more discussions at that level, but I think it would be, uh, be an interesting new addition. I, I think it would be cool. I'd be happy to help, although I can't really participate. Oh, yes, you can. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Since when? <laughs> I can ask questions if you no, want. That's the whole idea. That is the whole well, idea. And we could, I, I think this would be a really cool thing because yeah. you could go through and really give, give information <laughs> on what's happening you could update what's going on could. in vertical farms could, could. so you decide whether you want to and do how that interfaces with the spread of infectious diseases even because it does have some applications there too you could you could imagine that we could bring that in from time to time <laughs> well, let's Absolutely. try let's try to you know work on this one right. you've been listening to this week in parasitism thanks for joining us we'll be back soon Another twip is, is parasitic. parasitic. Happy Thanksgiving to those of you who celebrate it. You know, we forgot to mention that, but this is a postscript from me could... too. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Thank you, Dixon. Have may, a... it, may it be parasite-free. <laughs> Have a good week. I will, and you too, Vince. And in fact, I'm looking forward to your coming over to our house for, Thank for you. Thanksgiving. Thank you very much. Are you going to give me food poisoning? No, no, no. We're just going to sit around and talk turkey. <laughs>